You might think the Sony a7 III can't deliver professional or cinematic results. But you are wrong. Sure it has its limitations, but with the right color grading workflow, you can turn your Sony a7 III footage into rich and moody visuals that feel straight out of a film. Instead of just throwing on a LUT and hoping for the best, I will show you how to nail the fundamentals, so that you are finally ready to unlock the full potential of this camera. So whether you are just starting out or you are stuck in that almost cinematic zone, this workflow bridges the gap to achieve truly professional results. So welcome, let's get into it. All my example clips were shot with my custom HLG2 picture profile. But don't worry, everything that you will learn works with any other profile this camera offers. And considering that this is an 8-bit camera, I think the results look pretty amazing. And as you see, I keep it simple. I'm only working with 3 or 4 nodes for each and every clip, so it doesn't have to be time-consuming or complicated. You just have to get one thing right. We are talking about a solid color correction. If you get this step right, everything else, like LUTs or masks, that you throw on afterwards will work perfectly every single time. Vice versa, if you get it wrong, your color grade will fail before you even start it. And since you don't want that, I will show you how it's done properly. But first, we have to set up our project and timeline settings. We will open up our project settings on the bottom right and head to the color management tab. For the color science, we choose the Winchy YRGB, the timeline color space is the Winchy White Gamut Intermediate, and the output color space is Rec 709 Gamma 2.2. I already explained this in a previous video. Gamma 2.2 gives you more accurate results when you export your video for phones, tablets, or laptops. And since 80 or 90% of your viewers will watch the video on a phone, Gamma 2.2 is the way to go. I would only choose Gamma 2.4 if you are targeting TV or larger screens. The next thing that I would change down here is the 3D lookup table interpolation. By default it's set to trilinear and we want to change it to tetrahedral. This change is very important since it helps to reduce banding and color artifacts and it also helps to preserve details in our shadow areas. So for the project settings, tetrahedral and Rec 709 Gamma 2.2. Let's quickly check our master settings, but they are pretty much unnecessary because as you see here on the first line, any modification done here will not impact the currently loaded timeline, as they are being overridden by timeline settings. So it doesn't matter what you change here, the timeline settings are important. Let's have a look on them. Timeline settings. Okay, so I always match how I shot the footage, in my case 4K and 23.976 frames per second. If you move to the color tab, you can also double check your project settings, which are again the Winchy YGB, the Winchy White Gamut Intermediate, Rec 709, Gamma 2.2. Okay, so with the right project and timeline settings, we can actually move to the color page. So, the Sony a7 III shoots in 8 bit, which means we are working with way less color information than with other 10 bit cameras. Obviously, that's a painful fact that we have to work with and we are a little bit limited right from the start. But by using CSTs or color space transforms, we can transform our image into a wider color space. This gives us more flexibility and more room to push our grade and that's exactly what we want, right? Okay, so let's actually work with this clip as an example. First we delete everything here. And now we apply two nodes. The first node will be our transformation to the DaVinci White Gamut working space and the second one will be our transformation back to Rec 709 for the export. Ok, with our two nodes we can apply a color space transform to each of them. And yeah, here on the first node we will actually call it DaVinci White Gamut. The second one is called what? Rec 709. Ok, on the first node for the input color space I choose Rec 709. Yeah, you can always be faster if you just type it in, but I'm a lazy person, you know. And for the input gamma I also choose Rec 709. <laughs> Again. Ok, 
And for the output color space, I choose the Winchy White Gamut and the Winchy White Gamut Intermediate. Okay, this is our first note. If you're not sure about your input color space, there's an easy trick for that. Just move to the media pool, find your clip somewhere in the folders, and if you now choose the list option, you will see all the relevant metadata for each and every clip. If you now make a right click here, you can actually delete all of the unnecessary information. But somewhere here is the input color space. If you now check this box, you will see uh, the input color space for each and every clip. In my case, Rec 709, and that's the reason why I chose Rec 709 here in the input color space. So always check which input color space you're working with, and then you go to the color page on the first node, and this is exactly what you choose here. Okay, so this was the transformation into the DaVinci White Gamut working space. Now you can actually copy this, paste it onto the second node, and hit swap. For the output color space, Rec 709, since we want to export it in this working space. And for the output gamma, and this is important, we choose gamma 2.2. I guess you know why I choose it here, because if we double check our project settings, Rec 709, gamma 2.2. So now that's the perfect starting point with the right project settings and the right CST setup. And now we can move on to the funny parts, to our color correction part. With Option S on the Mac, you can create notes. If you make a right click here, you can clean up the note graph. And yes, the first note is labeled HDR Exposure. The second note is called Linear Balance. You can think of it as our white balance note. And the third note is called Contrast. What I always do is to start with the contrast node. We have to understand that contrast shows the difference between all your blacks and whites in an image and since our eyes get distracted by color, I always start by pushing the saturation down to zero. So that's what I do. Now here's a great trick. There is a really powerful tool called Middle Gray DCTL. If you apply it onto your node, choose Middle Gray, check all these boxes, and choose the winch intermediate, you will see a value of 0.336. This is your middle gray point or your pivot point. So for our pivot, we choose 0.336. This is the center point between all your blacks and whites and every adjustment you make around that point will lead to a perfect balance in your shot. Let's actually make all of that a little bit bigger so that you can see it better. Okay, so if you're now looking to the curve, you will actually see a peak. This peak represents the middle gray point or the pivot center point. You can actually lock this on this curve. And now, as I said, you can play around with the highlights and shadows without losing balance and without crushing any shadows or highlights. So, you can get rid of this mono middle gray now because you just locked in that point. And now, you can play around with your highlights and shadows, as I just said. You don't have to escalate, you don't have to overdo it. You can still go back and forth all the times between all your notes if you want to make any further adjustments. So, and now, yeah. If you're happy with the result, you can bring back the saturation. And here's a quick before and after. This is it for the contrast, now we can move to the second node, which is our linear balance, or as I said, white balance node. The only thing that I would change here is the gamma to linear and the loom mix to zero. This will provide us with more natural and more smoother results. Most of you would now play around with the tint and temperature slider to make an image warmer or cooler, but that's not the way that we want to work with this image. Both of these options will affect the image as a whole. And every adjustment you make further down on your node chain will be compromised based on this decision. Instead, the only knob that I would always touch to adjust my white balance is the gain wheel in the primaries tab. Since this is a sunrise clip, I obviously want to make it a little bit warmer, so I push the gain wheel a little bit towards the orange side. 
I think this looks okay for now. Here's a quick before and after. Okay, this is it for the white balance. Always remember to use the gain wheel in the primaries tab and don't forget to set your gamma to linear and the lumix to zero. We are done with the linear balance, now we can move on to the HDR exposure. As the name tells you, here we deal with the overall brightness of a clip. And instead of the offset wheel, I would always only use the HDR global exposure wheel, this one right here. The problem with the offset wheel is that at a certain point, you will crush your highlights and your shadows and we don't want that. So with the HDR global wheel, with the exposure slider here, you will never have a crush on either the top or the bottom end of the scale. So to adjust my exposure, I would only go a little bit higher here and you can still go back to the primaries tab and change a little bit of the shadow value or the highlight value for example. So, okay, I think this is quite good. Okay, so here's another before and after with every node deactivated. And I think this looks pretty solid already. This is the foundation. Color correction is the most essential part for every grade. Now you can add LUTs, you can add masks, you can play around with the saturation or U values for example. If you get this part right, everything else will fall into place. So if I now want to add a little bit saturation for example, I could easily do that. I go to the HDR global wheel again. Now I can push the saturation a little bit, maybe around here. We always want to keep things natural and realistic. Everything that you adjust should always match to the mood and tone of your story or the scenery. Give your image enough room to breathe. So, as you can see, the Sony a 7 III is way more powerful than most people think. And why? Because we nailed the foundation in the first place. Take yourself time to understand the basics, practice them and with time you will become a lot better at color grading your footage. Another game changer to achieve professional results are the right camera settings. So if you want to know my exact picture profile or the camera settings that I have developed over the last 3 years shooting with this camera, check out this video next. Thanks for watching.